this is this is Reform Theological's online uh, discussion forum uh, where we tackle a topic of scripture, theology, or ministry together. Our monthly discussions are designed to serve alumni, friends, current and prospective students, pastors, and congregants. Okay, really anyone who wants to grow in their knowledge and wisdom in the Christian life and service to the Lord, uh, you are in the right place. I include myself in that category, so it's an honor to be serving everyone in this capacity. If you don't know me, my name is C.L. Pierce. I'm the Director of Admissions here in Jackson, Mississippi. I want to send a warm welcome to all, but especially to those joining us for the first time and our uh, prospective students on the call today. Thanks for being with us. Um, leading the discussion today, as always, we have with us Dr. Ligon Duncan, our CEO, Chancellor, and Campus President. Welcome, Dr. Duncan. We also welcome back to the discussion uh, our friend and colleague, Dr. Miles Van Pelt. Dr. Van Pelt uh, prefers call, uh, to be called just Miles. Uh, that is, unless his Old Testament counterpart, fellow faculty member Dr. Mike McKelvey is addressing him. And under those uh, unique circumstances, he would much prefer the Hebrew hammer. Uh, <laughs> Miles is the Alan Hayes Belcher Jr. Professor of Old Testament and Biblical Languages. And he directs our Summer Institute for Biblical Languages. Uh, Miles brings a passion for teaching students the Bible in its original languages. He's published lots in the area of Hebrew and Aramaic language instruction, as well as biblical theology. Today, uh, we have 40 copies of Miles's 12-week study on the book of Judges to give away, and one providentially lucky winner will win a towering set of resources on the book of Judges and related content. In order to enter the giveaway, all you need to do is say hello in the chat, and as a reminder, we always leave lots of time for questions at the end. So please uh, send those uh, to everybody in the chat so they can see them. Or if you prefer, you can send those privately to me and we will get to as many as we can. Uh, before we get started, let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for laying a feast uh, before us in your word. And um, we thank you that all of it is profitable for your people, including this, this book, Lord, we're about to discuss, the book of Judges. Um, I ask, Lord, that you would teach us and lead us in all truth, even now, we pray. Amen. Dr. Amen. Duncan, send it back over Thank you, you so much, CL, and thanks, everybody, for joining. I see a, a bunch of friends on the call, and that always makes me happy, and I look forward to maybe having a few seconds to chat with you after we're done with Miles, but Miles is the man of the hour, and I want to make sure that we maximize this time, and so I'm going to jump right in, Mike, but I've got about 15 questions that I would love to ask Miles, mm -hmm. but you can go ahead and start sending in the chat questions which CL will collect, and then he'll feed to me, and I'll try and get to as many of your questions as well, but the obvious place for us to start, Miles, is how in the world did you get interested in judges like you are? What, what was the impetus for you focusing on this particular part of biblical literature? Um, in the mid nineties, the 1990s gang, uh, I, <laughs> I, uh, uh, it, was, it was either 95 or 96. I heard a recorded lecture um, by Dr. Gordon Hugenberger on the book of Judges. He was he was teaching a course or had taught a course at Gordon Conwell on the Judges. He was a local area pastor. And I got a chance to listen to one of those. And he was lecturing on uh, chapter two, part of the second introduction to the book of Judges, where it talks about the nature of the judges being raised up by the Lord. And during that hour long lecture, he he identified the judges as, as second Moses figures. And he worked hard to show how each of the judges kind of facilitated a fit into those patterns of, of judging and what they were doing is reminiscent of Moses's ministry as, as a covenant official. And I had never ever heard anything like that. And it, it just um, interested me. And so from that time on, I had been just uh, digging around in the book of Judges, trying to figure out how all that worked. And then when I landed at Gordon Con, or when I landed at a Reformed Theological Seminary in 2003, I was given that course to teach Joshua to Esther. 
And um, so I had a chance really over the last 20 years to focus on that book as a part of that course and came to write a commentary on it and that kind of business. So that's kind of the genesis of it, those, those lectures by Gordon Hugenberger. And so wow. if you're interested, you can actually go to the Park Street website and look up judges. And I think it was like 2012 or 2011, he preached a series, not through the whole book, but through most of the book. And you can hear his, uh, you can hear his um, sermons there um, for more of the individual judges and stuff like that. They're really good. Yep, Miles, um, my wife, Ann, studied under Dr. Hugenberger when she was at Gordon Conwell. I'm pretty sure that Catherine Cook and Chris Hutchinson on this call uh, have, have studied with Gordon and know him. Uh, so you've got some folks that know exactly who you're talking about yeah. uh, that are here today. That's a good impetus for uh, for study. And we're thankful that he piqued your interest and that you have thrown yourself into this particular part of the canon of scripture. If you were to say real quickly what mm. the main message of the book of Judges is, how would you put that? If you're, you're doing your mm. 60 to 90 second elevator speech about what this book is about, how would you, how would you characterize it? Boy, I mean, th there's a lot of different layers to that particular question, but I, you know, you could say it this way. I think God's people are sinners and they need saviors and uh, or a savior and all of those judges are types of saviors and yeah. so that's the main message of the book of judges god's people cannot get out of their sin by themselves and so the lord has to raise up deliverers or saviors to deliver them and that's that's the message of the book of judges that god will save his people when they cry out to him miles i know that you have thought a lot about the order and the structure of the old testament canon and maybe that goes back to to, uh, to Meredith Klein and, and you just thinking through Klein's sort of covenantal insights on the structural Old Testament canon, where do you see judges fitting in the canonical structure of the Old Testament? Yeah. Um, so there are three, in the Hebrew Bible, there are three sections, the law, the prophets, and the writings. You get Jesus referring to that to Luke 24. Uh, judges is in the second section, the, the prophets, and that second section is divided into two. There's the former prophets and the latter prophets. And the former prophets are Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. And those four books really um, uh, record the history of Israel's tenure in the land from their entrance in Joshua to their expulsion in 2 Kings 25 when they go into exile, 586 BC at the hands of the Babylonians. And so really what the, the former prophets all together testify to the faithfulness of God to his covenant promises in the midst of his people's unfaithfulness. Mm -hmm. And all the various ways in which he he works to deliver them. Um, and so the faithfulness of Yahweh to his covenant is one of the main themes of Joshua to Kings. And, and those books are used by the latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12, as evidence in their lawsuit against God's people for unfaithfulness to the covenant. That is, here's evidence of Israel's infidelity and Yahweh's constant fidelity to his people. That's mm -hmm. kind of canonically how it functions. Uh, the book of Judges also gets us ready for kingship that will come up in Samuel and things like that. So a lot of different yep. layers uh, to the, the, the figures there. Um, I, I was actually looking at, at a very, very old devotional outline that I had just done for myself. Uh, when, I, when I was at the University of Edinburgh and I was a single man doing a Ph.D., and my day was, you know, my schedule was under almost my total control. I went through about a two year period where I would spend two or three hours doing my devotionals. And one of the things I did in those morning devotionals was outline the Bible. And mm -hmm. uh, so this morning I pulled up the, the outline that I had done of, of judges and uh, I had it in, in three parts with uh, uh, chapters one and two being about Israel forsaking Yahweh and transgressing the covenant. And then uh, chapters 2 through 16, Israel's sin leading to oppression and seeing a pattern of Israel's sins. The Lord sends punishment, Israel repents, and the Lord delivers through a judge. And then a third section highlighting Israel's depravity. Um, as, as you think about the, the structure of judges, how do you like to outline it? Miles, is there a way you like to 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 divide the, the the you know the teaching up as you're getting ready to either teach it in a popular setting or in a seminary setting? 
Yeah, it, your outline is, is is spot on. There, in the book of Judges, there are two introductions and two conclusions. There are twelve judges, six major judges, six minor judges, and one anti judge, Abimelech. Mm. And the two introductions and the two conclusions are related to each other in an A B B A pattern. So it's it's A Israel's inability to possess the land. B idolatry, and then the conclusion is Israel's idolatry inability to possess or hold on to the land. Wow. The judge cycles in the middle. There are six major judges and they appear in two triads. So Othniel, Ehud, Deborah, Barak, and then Gideon, Samson, no Gideon, Jephthah, Samson, like that. And um, with the two introductions, the two conclusions and the two triads, it, it makes a picture like the seven days of creation from Genesis chapter one. And what's happening is it's the reverse of Genesis one. It's the uncreation of Israel as a nation because of their sin. So rather wow. than going from chaos to cosmos, it's going from cosmos to chaos at the end right there. Wow. Wow. So, okay, I know a lot of ink has been spilt uh, by scholars on what exactly a judge is. What's the Miles Mandel take on what a judge is? Yeah, so the word judge just it comes from that word to judge or show fate, show fatigue, judgment, stuff like that. According to Judges chapter two, where the Lord describes what he's doing, a judge is, a judge is someone raised up by the Lord, empowered by the spirit, uh, promised God's presence to deliver God's people. So there's kind of, there's, th there's really three, three things that get kind of associated with the judges. They're raised up by the Lord. They have the spirit, they deliver or they're saviors. And so not all of those designations get with each of them, but together they form that kind of complex. And in terms of judging, we often think of judging as, you know, uh, someone rendering judicial verdicts, and we only see Deborah doing that in the book. But what the judges are doing are bringing judgment on the nations for oppressing Israel. Mm -hmm. So in terms of judgment, that's what's happening. It's not they're not judging Israel. They're bringing judgment on the nations for their oppression of Israel. They're the instruments of God's judgment. Wow. OK, I want to come back to the spirit part, especially later, uh, Miles, but that's a very helpful sort of three part way of defining uh, the, the, you know, what a judge is and what a judge does. You've written two different works on judges already, Miles. Who are they written for and how are they different? Um, they're, they're both written, I, I think they're both written for Crossway. One is just that 12-week Bible study. And yep. so it just it takes us it takes you through the introductions to conclusions and some some episodes in the major judges. CL's holding it up right now. Yeah. It's got that little that that red triangle thing up in the corner, and it's got the sort of an ESV study Bible looking um, uh, spine, uh, and uh, and then it's a predominantly yeah okay. So there's one. Yeah, and then the other one it's in that it's in the the Crossway series. Um, what is it? The ESV. What is it, CL? ESV Expository Bible Commentary. And so it's in, it's got, a, I've got a copy here. It's, it's volume two, Deuteronomy through Ruth. So mine is, mine is one section in that particular thing. And it's, it's an expositional commentary. So it doesn't have a lot of footnotes and a lot of text critical work in it, like I would have liked. But I can tell you, um, Gordon Hugenberger is actually producing that commentary right now and should be on a couple of years with IVP in the Apollo series. Wow. That's great. Talk, talk to us about any repeated words or mm. phrases or concepts that are significant for uh, the book of Judges. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you two different ones. The first one um, would be what, what structures the major judge narratives. And, um, and it's uh, the children of Israel did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. It's repeated six times and it begins each of the judge narratives. And uh, that's the statement for the first judge and the fourth judge. So the beginning of the two triads. And then the judges that follow in those sequences would begin something like this. And the people of Israel did again that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so it's a modified formula, but it structures the whole book of the judges like that in those, in those six days or those, those six sections, three triads. The other one is the fourfold refrain in the conclusion um, in those days, there was no king in the land, and mm. twice, uh, and and Israel did that which was, and everyone did that which was right in their own eyes, and that does a couple of things. Um, one, it it that also stru that structures the um, the episodes in the two conclusions, so it's a, that repeated refrain gives you the breaks and the transitions, but it's also 
it's a it's a tacit reminder about what's going on in the book of Judges that Israel has rejected Yahweh as their king. So by saying in those days there was no king in the land, that's not true. The Lord was there, but this is kind of the, the this is the theological system that the the Israelites were operating under that they had no mm -hmm. king. They did, and then that prepares us again for what's coming up uh, in Samuel with with Saul and um, with Saul and David. In fact, the book of Judges is related to that. Um, in the in the two introductions and the two conclusions, um, it, there's a very anti-Benjamin, pro-Judah theme um, going mm -hmm. on, which which prepares you for the, the the contrast between Saul and and David later from Judah and Benjamin. Okay, now I I just ask you when we were sort of talking outlining about structural elements, and you've already suggested some significant structural elements. Anything else that you would want to draw? to our attention with regard to structural elements that help you when you're preaching or teaching through the book of Judges? Yeah, the Judges follow a fairly basic format. Um, there's about seven features. And if you read Othniel's, he, um, he's the first judge. It's just like uh, chapter three, verses seven to 11. It's like 16 contiguous clauses with no fluff. It's just, he did this, he did this, he did this, he did this. But that provides you the paradigm for all the Judges. They do evil. Uh, the Lord becomes angry and sells them into the hand of the enemies. They're oppressed. They cry out to the Lord. The Lord raises up a deliverer. The judge delivers. Uh, and then there's faithfulness. The judge dies. And then the people re uh, re resort back to their evil ways and getting worse every time. So you can see that it's the progressive corruption of Israel through the book of Judges. It gets worse and worse. And as, as Israel becomes worse and worse, it costs the judge more and more to save. Hmm. So you can see like with the last three Gideon's whole family is wiped out. Jephthah's one and only child is given up. And then it costs Samson his very life to deliver God's people. Wow. Now, again, this, this question follows on what you've just said, but do you want to talk to us about how those cycles work within the narrative? Yeah. The, I mean, this, this, there, there, yeah, there's six major judge cycles and um, you, you can kind of track the movements of them. And like any Hebrew narrative, you know, they're, they're not robotic in their patterning. They, they, you know, they modify and tweak and add and expand and stuff like that. And so it helps you, you know, in terms of working through your preaching or teaching through, you can, you know, preach in those episodes or stuff like that. Um, and there's a, as you go, the judge narratives get longer and longer. So that's a helpful thing to understand. What do you think are some of the most difficult passages to interpret in Ooh. the book of Judges? Yeah. Man, there are lots of them. Um, <laughs> um, and mostly, mostly they're difficult because of our modern approach to the book of Judges. It's hard to undo some of that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, thinking about Adani Bezek at the very beginning, the very opening narrative is they get this king. They cut off his thumbs and toes and they take him to Jerusalem where he dies after eating under the table for a while. And you're thinking like, what in the world would this even be in here for? Yeah. Uh, and he's, he's a special stylized king. It says that he had um, he had subjugated 70 other kings. Um, and that number 70 is significant because it's a reflection of the table of nations from the book of Genesis. And so what the book of Judges is doing is stylizing this guy as the king of the world. And, um, and Israel had to subjugate this king of the world in order to possess their promises. And so there's there's you got to figure out some tough things like that the the um the pledge or the the vow of Jephthah to offer up his daughter as a whole burnt offering causes some people some problem. Um, Gideon's incessant need for signs causes people some problem. Samson, you know, uh, you know, I don't know what to say. He causes people all kinds of things with, with <laughs> what appears to be moral failings that we misunderstand in the context. Mm -hmm. of, um, so some of those things. Um, one of the things that I, that I um, one of the things I haven't figured out yet, so maybe someone online can help me do that, is I have a very positive view of Gideon and his ministry, except for um, the making the making of the ephod at the end that causes his family to to stumble in idolatry. Huh. And so that's something I have not figured out yet. I mean, it could just be simply that, um, but after he died, his family, you know, resorted to idolatry again. Yeah. Well, I, as you you're, you will not be surprised that in the chat and when I asked online, the most common question I got was about Jephthah. So I'm going to come back to that in a little bit, uh, Miles. I'm yeah. not surprised at all that you mentioned that one as a difficult passage. But this 
this is the question I really want to ask you, and that is talk to us a little bit about the Spirit's role in the judge's ministry, and then I want you to place that biblically, theologically, in what you see is the development of the doctrine of the Spirit in the Old Testament. I'm really interested in this. I've been interested in this in a backwards way, mm. in the way that the Spirit's work is associated with the Abrahamic covenant in the New Testament writings, mm. and yet there's not much there in the Abrahamic covenant uh, in, in Genesis pertaining to the Spirit. The Spirit's all over judges. So talk yeah. to us about the role of the Spirit in the judge's ministry, and then place it in the context of the way you see that doctrine developed in terms of biblical theology of the Old Testament. Yeah, so the um, in the book of Judges, one of the things that marks a judge when he's raised up by the Lord is the promise of the divine presence, I will be with you, which, which is accompanied by the enabling presence of the Spirit. It's not an indwelling of the spirit but it's an external enabling of the spirit uh for example and and so the language is the spirit rushed on uh othniel that kind of thing um one of the judges is different gideon it says actually it says the the verb if you guys know hebrews lavash to put on it says the spirit put on gideon uh, and went out to battle and so there's this um enabling presence of the spirit to fulfill their judge role uh in order to save in order to save israel at that time you see a little bit of that uh, coming to play again um, in 1 Samuel 16, the call of David, where um, David is given the spirit uh, of kingship and it's removed from Saul and he's given that evil spirit, that troubling spirit. And so there's this sense that th these, um, this, th the spirit of Yahweh in this particular context is what enables the judge to deliver. Uh, it's what enables their feats, their miraculous feats, is that the, the Lord is going out before them in battle as kind of the theophanic spirit glory cloud, if you want to use Klein's words, and um, and and waging war. So he, he this this this. this this is now. So tell us then, how do you see how do you see the doctrine of the spirit in Judges relating to what goes before and what comes after it canonically? Well, um, you know, there's. I I'm going to distinguish between like the regenerating role of the spirit in the life of every believer from Adam on. Yeah. And then the, the special enabling presence of the spirit to do extraordinary things or to have certain gifts. For example, uh, the guys who built the tabernacle in the wilderness, right, had extraordinary gifts of the spirit in order to fulfill their mission to build the kingdom house. Mm -hmm. And so there's so in the book of Judges, we have that special enabling presence like we would uh, with, with someone like, oh, Noah, let's say or with you know, an extra portion of the spirit, not, I'm not talking about the regeneration that comes with yeah. level, but I'm talking about that, that enabling presence of the spirit. Yeah, and the same would be true even now there's, you know, uh, you know all believers are spirit filled, but you know, when people are called, for example, to preach or teach the word of God, yeah. they have special sure enabling presence of the spirit. Yeah, boy, the, th the thinking about those things of indwelling and enabling, um, actually, I think helps you when you're thinking about Luke Acts and yeah. and how the Spirit operates in that in that context, uh, and especially in light of the fact that we're already you get we're temple, you know, language right. uh, there. That makes sense on the indwelling part, but then the enabling of Pentecost, you know, that, that this is going to you know, and you will be my witnesses. And it's the right. Spirit going to enable you? to be my witnesses, both those things, that's a, that's a big deal in figuring out how things fit together. Okay, now this may be an unfair question, but do you have a favorite judge? Well, probably Samson because he's most maligned. Do you know, wow. I, I wow. like the underdogs. He's the, most, <laughs> he's, he's the most remarkable of the judges. He's the only one who, who, who does his entire ministry alone, hmm. right? He truly is alone. And, um, and and he fulfills his mission to do what he was born to do. The other thing I like about Samson, and this might not come up, so I'll just say it. Um, Samson is styled in the book of Judges as the forerunner of David. So because in his birth narrative, he said that he will begin to save Israel from the Philistines. And it's the, David who completes that mission. And if you connect the dots, you'll notice that the gospel writers um, recorded the life of John the Baptist after the pattern of Samson. They both have birth narratives. They're both Nazarites for life. They both eat honey. 
Uh, they're both forerunners and they're both betrayed by women unto death. And so there's this really nice connection wow. that been overlooked um, in that kind of forerunner yeah. thing. So as the last judge, he's the appropriate forerunner to the next to the next king or to the to wow. David. Wow. Okay. What is the conclusion of the book? Prepare us for, you know, as we're reading our Bibles, Miles. The conclusion of the book? Well, there's a couple of things going on there. You've got um You've got Israel's idolatry and kind of hiring priests and moving shrines and establishing golden calf worship, you know, all the way, you know, it's Exodus 32 to 34 all over again uh, with those, with the establishment of Dan up north. Um, you've also got the tribe of Benjamin becoming a sodomite like tribe. Uh, the events of Judges 19 uh, rehearse the events of Genesis 19. So Judges 19, Genesis 19 where um, the men of the city come to the visitor and want to have illicit sexual activity with him. And, um, and they, so they become, they become, God's people become Canaanites. This is progressive decay of God's people. Dan Block calls it the Canaanization of Israel. Mm. So they've become fully Canaanite by this point, And therefore Judah has to wage holy war on them. They put them to the ban. And mm. so it really, uh, you know, it, it shows, you know, uh, when the New Testament speaks of the Mosaic Covenant as a ministry of death, we really see that being worked out in the tribe of Benjamin right here, mm -hmm. because their disobedience to that covenant resulted in their almost extinction, except for those 600 men. Wow. So, yeah. Uh, Jim Sayers, a uh, friend of mine uh, on Twitter, asked a great question, and uh, it, it basically goes like this. You know, if if we if we didn't have the book of judges in the canon, what, what would we miss out? You know, I guess that's a, that, that's a way of asking what are some of the unique contributions yeah. of the, of the book of judges to, to, to the whole biblical story. Yeah. I, one of the things that the book of judges focuses on most is um, Israel's inability to keep the covenant. Therefore their corruption and subjugation but the willingness of the Lord in every instance to, to hear their cry and to come to their saving. And I think no other book in the Old Testament focuses on that like any other. It's, it's do it once, do it twice, do it three times, do it four times, do it five times, do it six times in those judge cycles. And so it really is hammering you on the head that the Lord, that the Lord desires to save and to heal his people. And he desires to be in covenant with his people and have fellowship with his people. And he's, he's ready to, he's ready to, he's ready to come back and get them every time. And so there's that strong sense. It, what it really does is it, it points out, you know, that's what, that's what the word chesed means in Hebrew. Mm. It's God's commitment to continue to save his people in spite of the fact that he should just smoke them all. Mm. What they, yeah, we've already got tons of really good questions coming in from the folks on the call. So I'm going to go right to them, Miles. And, and, okay. and naturally, you will not be surprised. The very first one is about Jephthah's vow. Okay. Judges 11. So did he sacrifice his daughter? What's going on there? Yes. Did he sacrifice? So my answer is, my answer is yes, but not by death. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. So um, um, Jephthah vows a vow that that whatever comes first out of his door when he returns home, if he's if he's uh, victorious, is that he will offer it up as an ola, a whole burnt offering. Okay, um, and it happens to be that his daughter comes out. It's his only daughter, um, and already that language is reminding me of Genesis 22. It's one of the few times the word yahid or only is used. This is a special word. Um, so you've got Isaac being offered up as a whole burnt offering, a yahid. You've got Jephthah's daughter being offered up in this very same way. Um, and so the question is then, did he kill her? Because it doesn't say at the end that he killed her, it just says he he fulfilled his vow. Mm. Now, if you look, if you look at the text from the vow to the very end of the chapter in chapter 11, it's 100 percent related to virginity. It's not related to death at all. So she asked to go away for three, one, three months to, to mourn her virginity. And then if you look at the very last, I don't have my my text is not open at this point. If you look at the end of Judges 11 there, it says, and he fulfilled his vow, that is, she never knew a man. Mm. Uh, and so 
And so the better argument is that, you know, what Jephthah did is what he dedicated to full-time tabernacle service, which is something like what happened to Samuel, for example, or, you know, we know there were women who served at the tabernacle like that, and she wouldn't have been married and he wouldn't have his, his, he wouldn't have offspring. His line would be finished. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, in that day, uh, that was as good as death to them. And so, and so we can use the the language of sacrifice. Think of, you know, think of Romans 12. Therefore, offer your body yeah. as a what? A living sacrifice. And so yeah. that language can be metaphorical. And I think it's the better argument. You know, I, can, I can't imagine, you know, if you think of Judges 11 at the end of Judges 11, uh, the three worst judges, so-called, right? Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson are the ones mentioned in the Hall of Faith. And I can't imagine um, Jephthah's final act being child sacrifice and ending yeah. up in the Hall of Faith. Yeah. Um, yeah. The book of Hebrews, I mean, the book of Hebrews calls these guys men of faith. And if you read the accomplishments that they achieved at the end, you're, you're thinking, this is amazing. And then it says, of whom the world is not worthy. Yeah. So, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you know, yeah. when it comes to interpretational schemes, I'm going to let the New Testament boss me around on how I view the Old Testament. <laughs> so. And you get, you get how that's tricky working in, I mean, you, and I want you to be able to, to give your unique take on the evaluation of these judges, Miles, because, you know, okay. it, it's just how you interpret some of, you know, what are the, what are Moses' tacit criticisms of characters in Genesis? That's a tricky question, yeah. interpretably. Yeah. And it's even, in my opinion, it's even trickier in Judges. Because yeah. you, you know at the end of the book, there is a not a tacit, but an explicit indictment of the whole religious system of, mm. of Israel. But then you have to figure out what's being criticized in a judge and what's not. So... Mm. Did, what, what do you think the assessment of the author is of Jephthah? Is, is, is something being commended to us about him, or is it just being observed about him, or is it being criticized about him in that particular vow occasion? Yeah, I mean, the, I, I don't know. You know. It's hard to read between the lines. I don't see, yeah. any, I don't see any criticism of Jephthah within the narrative itself. Yeah. Uh, from the author the author simply records the events um the evaluation the only evaluation i get from that comes from genesis or from hebrews 11 mm -hmm. where they're they're evaluated now that doesn't mean they're perfect of course right yeah. we know moses was this you know you know made god mad on several occasions you know same right. and did crazy things um and so but i'm not saying that but i don't think the author of the book of judges who we don't know uh was writing uh, to create kind of like um, flannel graph, moralistic kind of tales. Yeah. Uh, this is what happens when you do bad. And this is what happens when you do good. Yeah. These, these are kingdom narratives and the judges are kingdom covenant officials. And it's describing, it's more concerned about describing how Yahweh is using them as the instruments of his deliverance uh, but through the enabling power of his spirit. Not so much. Look at this judge. He's so bad. How could the Lord use him? Yeah. You know, thing. Which is okay. how we normally take it. Here's the second question. Leviticus tells us that touching an unclean animal carcass makes a person unclean. Would Samson have been unclean getting the honey out of the dead lion? Okay, it's a great question. So this relates to his Nazarite vow. Uh, only two people are Nazarites for life in the Bible, by the way, John the Baptist and Samson, another forerunner thing. Um, and if you read back in Leviticus, there are three stipulations. Uh, you can't cut your hair or your beard so you kind of look like a wild man. You can't drink wine or even touch grapes, that kind of thing. You can't touch um, a dead person, a dead person. You can touch food. You can't touch a dead person. That's what makes you unclean. That's what makes you unclean and all, all everyone unclean that way. Um, so Samson was born to kill Philistines. That was his job description. And so, um, and he did it without any normal weapons. He did it with the jawbone of a donkey and, you know, uh, crushing them with pillars, you know, that kind of thing. And so um, his Nazarite vow is often, it's often argued that he violated all of his Nazarite vows. He threw a banquet for the Timnite bride. He must have drank. It never says he drank. Uh, he, he touched the lion carcass. Well, yeah, you can, you know, Nazarites were not vegetarians. They all ate meat. And so, and they weren't, it wasn't fed to them. 
And so uh, th that's not what made them unclean. It was touching a dead person. Um, he did, he, his, his vow was eventually violated when Delilah in chapter 16 cut his hair. And that's when the enabling spirit, presence of the spirit left. Mm. And he was able to be subjugated, mm. which is okay. interesting to think about that because we often think of Samson as kind of this muscle bound deliverer. But if they couldn't figure out why he was so strong, he probably just looked like one of us. And so it was the spirit that made him strong, not his kind of musculature. Wow. Here's another question. My pastor preached through judges recently, and he kept saying that the judges saved Israel, but he didn't explain what he meant by that. Could you flesh that out uh, and talk about how they, you know, are they a type? uh of 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 say of a savior you know covenantally speaking I, I explain that yeah 100 percent they are they're even the the verb that the, the verb that's used is yesha and then the, the noun moshia to save or a savior just like we would apply to jesus okay or joshua or moses whatever so they definitely are saviors but with let's say small s not capital s right and uh they were not the agents of deliverance you've got to remember that they were the instruments of God's mm. deliverance. Mm. And, and getting that right and watching those pronouns and stuff and knowing the difference between an agent and an instrument is huge. It's even caused mistranslation in Judges 3 about the nature of Othniel's judgeship. Uh, it, says, it says that the Lord saved them with Othniel, but the translations say Othniel saved them. So there's, there's this, that, that misunderstanding between instrument and agent is huge. And so it was the Lord who saved them. The judges, mm. the judges were their kind of, the, the judges were, were, you can put it this way, the judges were Yahweh's jawbone. Hmm. He wielded them in battle. Wow. Wow. Okay. It, naturally, we've got a question about Deborah. And, uh, and, it's, and this is a judgment from you in your opinion. Why was Deborah called to be a judge during her time? Um, she, was a, she was a prophetess. Right. Um, and it, and she, actually, the, the designation judge does not um, really apply to her. She was a prophetess. It's actually Barak who was the judge. And there was this combo of Deborah Barak, which is intended to remind us actually of Moses and Miriam, because the deliverance they the deliverance they achieve um, for God's people recorded in uh, Judges five is a rehearsal of the type of deliverance that Israel experienced at the Red Sea. When Moses and Miriam then sang a song together at the after wow, that. and so uh, she, the the book of Judges has some great female figures in the book. I mean, who doesn't like Jael, right? She, <laughs> uh, right? She's the one who I reminds can think of us. at least one guy that doesn't yeah. like Jael. <laughs> yeah, Sisera. But you know, she reminds us that the promise of Genesis three fifteen is still in action. That God is subduing uh, the enemy by crushing their heads. And yep. so it's, it's just great stuff you see. And, you know, um, it, it was said to Gideon that when he goes out to battle, the glory will not be his, but it'll be given to another. Mm -hmm. And, and he still went, uh, he, he was not a glory freak. Mm -hmm. And, um, the women are, you know, what, one of the things that the Lord is always doing in all of these judges, but in special ways, sometimes is showing that he's delivering Israel through human weakness. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, with Gideon's army, he says, hey, you have way too many people. You guys will think you did it. I need mm. to whittle them down to 300 so that you know that I did it. Mm. And so these amazing, like Othniel, the left-handed guy, or yeah. Ehud, the left, Ehud, the left-handed yeah. guy, and uh, Jephthah, the son, of a, the son of a prostitute, and all these kinds of things. So, you know, there's, yeah. there's all these different things for the most unlikely figures, which prepares us for the most unlikely type of savior to come along later as well. Mm. Um, here's another question. How would you explain the function of Israel's judges in comparison with other figures of leadership like prophets or kings, et cetera? Yeah, so it'd be closer to kind of the king role than the, the prophet role. They were not oracular guys delivering thus saith the Lord messages. Um, they were covenant officials. And so they were, in, they were in some sense, what they did is they delivered God's people from oppression of, of the enemy and they secured Israel's obedience during their life. So that, that, and that's what the king was supposed to do, right? The king was yeah. supposed to be a faithful Torah keeper and lead Israel into faithfulness to keeping that law. And that's what the judges did. They, they first, they delivered 
then they secured obedience and fidelity. And then when they died, right, then it, it all unraveled. And it unravels in the book of Judges six times. And so by the end, you're just saying to yourself, man, if we could just get a savior who wouldn't die, we could fix this problem. Mm. Miles, what are some of the pitfalls and dangers when you're preaching and teaching through Judges? Anything that you would recommend us not to do when we're preaching? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, first, always warn your audience when you're about to read stuff that this is rated PG-13 or above yeah. material. Yeah. Um, yeah. John Fesco, one of my, our colleagues, f- has famously said to me, you know, if I were to live during those days, it would scare the heck out of me. Because yep. of the violence and the murdering and just the infidelity and idolatry, it just was not a great time. And so, you know, when you're talking about, you know, the rape of the concubine and her cutting up into 12 pieces, I mean, yeah. you have to be careful in the context in which you preach or teach that, that you're not overly focusing on those gory details. They're supposed yeah. to be shocking and they're shocking on their own. So you don't have to uh, to overdo it. Does that make sense? And so yeah. I've preached. I've preached the whole book in the context of, of a local church uh, with my family in it, kids there. Uh, in fact, we, yeah, so uh, in-laws were in there. So it's, it's, um, it can be done. And I, th- so the thing is, the main thing is, gang, if you're going to preach or teach from, remember this, the judges are types of Christ, not types of you, right? If you want to identify with anyone in the book, you're Israel, the person who keeps doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. And I think that's I think that's probably the best hermeneutical clue I can give you in terms of that. The judges point us to Christ. Israel points us to our need for that Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, what what's your take? Here's another question. What's your take on the evil that was done by certain judges in light of the fact that some of them end up in the Hall of Fame of Faith in uh, in Hebrews 11? Yeah, maybe um, the maybe the question have to be more specific. Um, because I don't think the judges did anything evil. Mm. Now, um, Israel does Israel does that which is evil, right, in the eyes of the Lord, and every time that evil is idolatry. So that, that that's the you know, uh, and we'll say like they forgot the Lord, which is which is gospel, which is covenant infidelity, uh, that kind of stuff. And so yeah, so you're thinking about like okay, let's let's think about Samson in chapter 16 verses one through three with his one night one night stand with the prostitute in gaza right um people always impugn him that one author calls him a good friend of ours calls him a sex addicted nazarite uh, (laughs) i won't tell you who said that (laughs) um um, but if you if you uh if you look more closely the language there there is no there is no explicit language of sexual intimacy. Uh, it just says he went to her house and spent the night. Um, and then he got out in a mysterious way at night and, and took the, the city gates with him. Uh, so two things are happening there. Number one is it's rehearsing what the spies did in Jericho. When you go to spy out a place, you don't stay in the, right, the town center, stuff like that. You stay at the, the prostitute's house because that's the inn. And so the, the exact language of the two spies in Jericho with Rahab is being rehearsed here. So Samson is that kind of person. And when he goes away, he takes the city gates and he takes them on a 40 mile hike to Hebron. So that would have been a spirit enabled act because you know, the city gates was your first line of defense. And so they were huge and heavy. And, um, and, so, and, and it's a reminder, like just like Jael crushed the head of Sisera, the serpent, right? There is a uh, promise to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant that he will possess the gates of his enemies. And it's, repeat, it's repeated to Rebecca. And so here you see uh, Samson entering into a city and possessing the gates of God's enemies like this. And so we're, we're, we're reading it covenantally, biblical, theologically, mm-hmm. not as if it's an illustration of the trouble you can get into if you go to a prostitute's house, which you can. I'm not saying you should, but I'm saying this yeah. is what Samson is. the author there. Yeah. He's not describing a one-night stand. He's describing a, an act of destruction of the city because he'll come back later and destroy their temple. And if you think about how Israel is destroyed or Jerusalem was destroyed and how you wage war in the ancient Near East, you take their gates and then you sack their temple because you you crush their defenses and then you yep. humiliate their God. Yep. And so that's exactly what's happening in Judges 16. What do you do with Shamgar? Uh, I read it. I read it quickly. 
(laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there's not much you can do. So, you know, he's the guy who killed all the Philistines with an ox goad, right? And his, a lot of people think he wasn't even an Israelite because his name means a, a sham there, Gar, a, a sojourner. So a sojourner in that area. So they don't know. I can tell you, all I can do, all I can do is tell you that the six minor judges mark climactic judges. So there's one, there's one minor judge before the Gideon Barak, or the Gideon, sorry, the, the, the Deborah Barak narrative. Mm. There's two judge, minor judges before Jephthah. And then there's three minor judges before the last and most climactic judge, Samson. So that's the role of those judges. Uh, and it, it also, you know, it talks about their great wealth in, in some of those contexts. They had 30 donkeys, 30 cities, 30 sons, stuff like that. So it would have been talking about, it looks almost like pre-kingly in terms of the mm-hmm. way they were things. It was definitely ancient Near Eastern Bedouin life for sure. Yeah. What are, what are some contemporary application points when, when you look at judges, you're preaching and teaching through it. What are some of the contemporary application points that you like to make in light of, you know, how, how the book of Judges points to uh, new, the new covenant? Yeah. Um, how the book of Judges points to the new covenant. Well, yeah, the book of Judges certainly prepares us for the new covenant because one of the points of application would be you can see that the mosaic economy is not working very well for the Israelites. Yeah. Uh, because, right, it's one that it's one that can give people an enabling spirit, but it's not circumcising their hearts. Yeah. And so uh, it prepares us for the new covenant that way. You can also see our own inability to produce obedience on our on our own. Mm-hmm. That it has to be it has to be the spirit's work in us. Uh, so it, it helps to emphasize that. I mean, I think another thing, two point of application is it just it just so strongly shows the strong need that we each have for a savior. That but for the grace of God, we are Israel. Hmm. And, and, we, and if you're like me, you still struggle living like Israel sometimes. And so, and then you repent. Uh, and it just shows you that I know that with the pattern of the book of Judges, I know that the Lord is going to come running back for me. And he, he's longing for me to repent and stuff like that. And I think that's one of the messages of the book of Judges, that the Lord, Lord longs for people to repent because he's so willing to come and save. And now in light of the work of Christ, you know, that's that's an amazing encouragement. Yeah. Uh, and it, and it provides you great comfort and ability to confess your sins and repent from them. Mm. Miles, is, what's what what's what's your view of the significance that Saul is from Gibeah? Yeah, I love that. So if um, so, the Book of Judges has a very strong Jude, pro Judah anti Benjamin uh, polemic in it. If you look at the very first chapter, there's 21 verses devoted to to um, Judah's faithfulness to possess the land, and one verse that says. And Benjamin couldn't do it. <laughs> so, and then at the very end of the book, you get this uh, this couple newly reunited. The, the 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 Levite man went and got his wife who had left him and, and abandoned him, uh, was bringing her home. And they weren't going to stay in the pagan city, Jerusalem. They were going to stay, or the Jebusite, they were going to stay in, in Gibeah because it was an Israelite city. And it ended up being worse for them. It was like a Canaanite city. And so, um, oh, now I got off track. Like, remind me of the question. Well, we were just about the significance of Saul being from. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. here we go. And so by the very end, so all of that takes place in 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 Gibeah of Benjamin. And so and what we know about those guys is they're Sodomites and so or Canaanites. And so when Israel asks for a king like all the other nations, man, there's no better city for it to come from than Gibeah of Benjamin, because that's all the other nations. Wow. Saul's name means what was asked for. And so, you know, you asked for it, you got it. And, yeah. and if you think about it, what was one physical characteristic of Saul? He was tall, right? So yeah. he's like a Goliath type figure. Yeah. And so, so yeah. So when, when the Lord tells Samuel to go anoint this guy, you should be thinking, yeah. dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Right? Like, that's for both already the opposite of Deuteronomy 17, which says you're not supposed to look for somebody like the nations, you know, right. you're exactly. look something like what God wants for you. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so that's why, uh, you know, for example, in first Samuel 13, we went after the, after um, first Samuel 13, I think it's 14 after the Lord rejected Saul from king, being king. Then it says, and the Lord went and sought out for himself a man. So this was going to be the Lord's choice at this point, not the people's choice. 
Okay, um, here's another question. It, it, are there any specific passages in Judges that, that you like to highlight most as foreshadowing Christ? Or is it just a general foreshadowing of Christ throughout the book with the individual judges just being a part of a larger example? I think there's, I think there's both to that. Uh, I think there are both more specific things. If you think about the judgeship of, of Othniel with just those very few verses, you know, we don't know how he delivered. We don't know how many he delivered. We just know that they got saved and stuff like that. So some of the judges, we, you know, they're types of Christ in this way that they're all designated as a Moshia and are empowered by the spirit. Uh, now, some of the things that Samson does, for example, you know, or, or let's say Gideon, you know, they have some more kind of like redemptive historical connections with people like Moses or John the Baptist or even Jesus later and stuff like that. So there would be more. I mean, think of, you know, the line at the end of Judges 16 where it says in his death, he delivered, you know, he killed more Philistines on that day than in his life. So he's <clears> his <throat> ultimate act of his ultimate act of faithfulness to his calling was his death. <clears throat> uh, and so even people who disagree with me on the view of judges, like a guy named Barry Webb, who's a very prominent judge scholar, will say, Samson reminds him so much of Jesus, it's hard to overlook. Wow. Um, yeah. And so, and wow. even though he's a detractor, he, he would detract from my view, which is fine, you know. Yeah. Uh, Miles, do you see a downward spiral in the judges' cycles that, that show a worse and worse condition of the people of God? A, a thousand percent. Yeah. That's, that's and, and until it reaches its climax in the tribe of Benjamin with total corruption. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and I think that that's what Dan Block calls the canonization of Israel. Yeah, they were they were they were supposed to exterminate the Canaanites in order that they would not become like them and worship their gods and marry their women. But that's exactly what they did. Mm -hmm. And so and and so it's in some sense it's showing us if you look at the end of Deuteronomy twenty nine to thirty one, it says Israel, you're going to go into the land and you're not going to obey and you're going to become corrupt and I'm going to have to expel you from the land. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's not two books later that that's fully, it's fully recognized, right? And it's just, there, it's on a ticking time bomb until God is, has fulfilled his kind of covenantal plans with the kingship and David and all that business, the building of the temple until that, until that ends. And so it's, uh, it's, it's right on track. So in some sense, the book of Judges is, is outlined and prophesied about in Deuteronomy 29 to 31, all right, the backbone of it right there. Mm -hmm. It's it is it, it's an illustration of the kind of language you get into this is six too that every intent of the thoughts of their heart is yeah. only continually by the time you get to the end of the book. Yeah, um, that's exactly are right. there are there um, some ways that we misread the book by being too individualistic in the way that we're taking figures, Miles? I mean, do you, are you are you concerned at all about an individualistic lens? Well, sometimes you can overly individualize things. Yeah. Um, you know, growing up the way I grew up and you interpreted narratives like this, you know, it was like, you know, three ways you can be more like jail, four ways yeah. you can be less like Gideon. And right. I, um, and, and, I, and I, don't, I think that misses the point of the book of Judges. I mean, certainly you can learn from what they do. And I think the book of Hebrews says do. They were men and women of faith who risked their lives to be faithful. Uh, and so I think that's the example that we take from them, right? We can take that global example from them. And that's, an, that's something you can apply individually to, to believers, right? Uh, or to yourself. Uh, but I don't, you know, I think like um, moralizing, I call it the where's Waldo approach to interpretation. Yeah. You open the Bible and, you, and you're Waldo and on yeah. page, you're looking for yourself. And <laughs> It, yeah, and so the Bible is really a where is Christ book. So where you're opening the page, thinking about where is Jesus. And yeah. I think that's what Jesus is saying in, in Luke 24, that all of these things testify to me. And so I think if by individual approach, you mean that it ultimately gets you to Jesus, I'm down with that. Mm -hmm. But if you think it's ultimately running to you, so yeah, I, I try to say it this way in my class, the Bible is not written about you, it's written for you. And, and so I think that's a helpful way to, to begin interpretation. Now, you're, you're also in it because you're the people that God has saving. Sure. You provide, that sure. Kind of thing. But I'm talking about kind of a stark hermeneutic that we usually apply to the Old Testament when we don't know what to do about all these people dying and all these people getting chopped up and 
piled into a big hill of dead bodies and thinking, how's that going to work? And, and by the way, th those sorts of interpretive questions, you can find those in ecclesiastical history, in the history of commentary, long before our modern individualistic age. I mean, it, uh, oh, yeah. one of the reasons that the allegorical method develops in early Christianity is they're so freaked out over what to do over narratives like this, yeah, whether it's exactly the flood right. narrative or the possession of Canaan or the, you know, the, the, the concubine passage. They're freaked out over how in the world do you interpret this in a Christian way. And so they, you know, some of the, some of the crazy allegorization methods that, that you see developing are long, long before the age of individualism. Yeah, that's so uh, true. That's so true. Yeah. Um, Miles, okay, here's, here's, here's a long stretch question, and, and, the, and the questioner even puts stretch in it, so feel free to do with it what you want. Here, here it goes. This might be a massive stretch, but <laughs> since there are six cycles, and the Bible places significance on the number of seven as the number of completion, is Christ seen as the final complete judge filling the number seven spot? Hmm. Maybe Step will answer that question for us. So. <laughs> um, um, so certainly Christ is the ultimate judge. He's yep. the ultimate spirit and able deliverer. Um, is the number six written so that there's one lacking? That's a, I, I haven't given that thought enough. It, yep. it, it, it it's possible it may be a little bit of a stretch um, yeah. because you do have the seventh section in there, which is the double conclusion. Yeah. Um, and so, or there's actually eight boxes really yeah. on my thing. And so, but that I'm not, no, oh, I'm going to back up and say, I doubt it now. Yeah. Because the number six is really just half of them. There's 12, there are 12 judges. Correct. And those 12 judges represent Israel. Right. Yeah, and the so direction seems to be down, which right. Im, which implies the need for a savior. Yeah. But yeah. the direction seems to be down, with the conclusion a negative conclusion on yeah. uh, on on the situation of Israel, and thus the need for a king. So it's set definitely setting the table for yeah. the need for a king, and then the kingship narratives clearly. Uh, point to Christ in the New Testament say, you know, it right. just explicitly uh, says that they do. Um, okay, you've already mentioned Hugenberger. Other sources on the book of Judges you want to just bring to our attention, Miles, other than the stuff that you're mm -hmm. writing? Um, so there's a, there's a gentleman named Barry Webb who's written a book on the Judges, and I think two commentaries on the book of Judges that are very good. Um, there's, a, there's a gentleman named, he's a vicar, in, in London, his name is, is Ryan Rogers, and he he did a PhD at Cambridge, and he, he has a book called uh, Reading Judges, and it's actually, uh, he has a positive view of the judges. He's the first guy I know to publish a book with a positive view on judges. Wow. And then I'd say the standard commentary that everyone likes is Dan Block's commentary in the book of Judges. Yeah. Although, although he takes a very negative view of the judges, yeah. uh, the information in that book about the background, you know, Biblical theological connections, hist historical connections, all that kind of business. Good exegesis is there, so that would be you know if, if you can right. kind of set the final analysis of the individual judges aside. There's a lot to work from that, but I would my first would be Barry Webb, and That's then Dan, Dan Block. Then I would um, run with Ryan Rogers. We're almost at the top of the hour, and I've got a couple of more questions from from CL, and so I'll ask them real quick. Any thoughts about some people that criticize Samson for suicide. Uh, it, what's your what's your take on understanding what Samson is doing there in the temple? Yeah, um, I think Samson probably knew this was going to get him killed, um, but I think he wasn't committing suicide. But he was he was giving over his life to deliver God's people, mm. um, and that's a different thing. I think you know any Israelite. Who went out to war, you know, as an act of obedience to God's calling, knew that there was the possibility they could lose their life. Yeah. So this is not something unusual. And again, I think if Samson's final act in life would have been kind of the egregious sin of suicide, we would not see him 
in the Hall of Faith in Genesis chapter 11. In fact, yeah. if you read the description of events in Hebrews 11 after the judges are mentioned, no other person identifies with more of those accolades than Samson himself. Wow. So it's, if you try to add up like which one, you know, there's like 12 or 13 yeah. things and you try to list all the judges out mentioned and put, put what under yeah. the eye, he gets the most. So it's more like a, a military hero who gets to a particular point in the mission and he realizes in order to do my job, it's probably going to cost me my life yeah. and I'm going to do my job mm -hmm. in order to protect my country or to pre yeah. protect my buddies or to fulfill my leadership role. And that's just what it's going to cost yeah, that's a great uh, rather that's than a deliberate act of self-murder. Right. That's a great way to put it. It's a great way to yeah. put it. Well, Miles, this has just been super stimulating and, uh, you know, <laughs> leads me to want to ask. I've heard Miles preach on some of this material. And of course, I've read him in the ESV uh, material and it's always edifying. And I'm so thankful for the amount of time and energy you put into reading and studying to help us understand judges better. I've already seen tons of comments in the chat uh, about how people are appreciative of what you've done and of this conversation. So CL, thanks so much for setting this up. Miles, thank you so much for spending an hour with you. Back over to you, CL. Thanks so much, Dr. Duncan. Thanks again, Miles. Appreciate both of you guys. Um, just a quick announcement about uh, the next online discussion forum. Dr. John Fesco will be back with us in August. Uh, the date is August 25th. That's a Thursday from noon to one. We're going to be talking about a very important topic, grace, uh, grace and the doctrine of salvation. Dr. Fesco has just recently uh, written a new book. Imagine that. Dr. Fesco writes a book every week. Um, this one's called Arminius and the Reformed Tradition. So uh, Dr. Fesco is going to be doing a little bit of a historical theological take on Arminius and the Reformed Tradition, August 25th. 12 to 1, sign up for that. Uh, so happy to have all you guys uh, on the call, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, CL. Great, Great to have you all here, Chris. Good to see your face.